I'm, I've got um, six, seven handouts today. In addition to the PowerPoints for chapter four and five, I've also got, but you're going to have to go to uh, Blackboard to get these if you don't already have them. I've got this periodic table that's marked off the ones I want you to memorize are in uh, red boxes. Okay, so you need a copy of that. And then uh, I've got a review document for chapters four and five. Looks like that, looks just like a test. And there's also a key in there that you can, you can uh, access that if you want. I, I'm not handing one of those out. There's <clears throat> too much printing. But I also have um, work problems. In other words, this is the way I work each one of these problems in case you need that extra input. And then I've got extra credits. For chapters four and five, I got two of them. One is this one. And there, it's clearly marked in Blackboard as extra credit. And what, what I want you to do is build a periodic table using these instructions. And the second page is a blank periodic table for you to fill in. Um, colored pencils probably work best. Crayons are too messy. And then this one is uh, naming compounds. So you've either got the name and you write the compound or you got the compound and you write the name. And the answer sheets here, let's see, there. And on the back, I've got a reprint of all the polyatomic ions. So when you run across a polyatomic ion in here, you'll know you can, you can look it up. How do I send this in? Like if I, I print the stuff out, how Say can again? I send the, how can I send like the homework and stuff like that in? Like if it's paper. The each each location where you find these documents has uh, within that folder is a attach. That's what it's called. Attach files. So when you finish with it. Um, sometimes the work is in a fillable form, a PDF file, so you can fill it in and save it. Even if you're on your reader, I've enabled saving. Um, so, but for the ones where you have to actually draw something, you're going to have to photograph or scan it. And then those documents will be, uh, you can attach them. Have I not shown that to this class yet? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, I'll, let me do that. Um, see, I got to do it on the other computer. Okay. So we're down here to module two. There we go. And then scroll down. Those are all the PowerPoint slides. Learn these element symbols. This is the first one. And there's your PowerPoint, I mean, a PDF file. And then scroll on down to uh, review documents. This is where you'll find the, um, the review, the answer key, and work problems. There's also a, another polyatomic ion here, just like the one that's in the extra credit. Uh, let's see, let's go back. Ah, right this way. There we go. Uh, let's see. Here they are, extra credits. So if you click on this note periodic table, then 
you have access to this file here. This, this is the PDF file. And then when you get finished with it, save it to your computer and then go look for it. Browse my computer and attach the file. And then once the file is attached, uh, use hit submit. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me go back to our PowerPoints. All right, we've got two chapters to cover today. First one is normal length. The second one is kind of short. So I think we can get through both of them. All right. <clears throat> Save. Chemical Foundations is the chapter four. Chapter four and five will be on the next exam, exam two. Um, that's just a table of contents. I'll skip that because we're going to get there anyway. Okay. Uh, at one time, we only knew 115 elements. Now we know 118. And there are 100, and all of the 118 have names. They have given names now. It's not just placeholders. Originally, uh, 88 of those were found in nature, and all the rest of them were man made. But we've since, our, our analytical techniques have become more refined, and now we're able to find some of those man made elements in nature but they're very small quantities. Okay. Um, the elements and their names and their symbols in the periodic table are the uh, vocabulary. No, the alphabet, that's what they are. They're the alphabet of chemistry. So you, that's why I want you to learn those uh, red box element symbols. If you haven't already done that, there are about 60 of them out of the 118, roughly. Um, so I found the best way to memorize these things is to make flashcards. Just put the symbol on one side, the name on the other, and make the cards yourself because the, the act of of actually producing the cards is uh, a memory act in itself. And then just flip through them until you know them. Um, let's see. Here we go. This is, um, yeah, this is the one you can see the red boxes. So I have most of the alkaline metals and the alkaline earths and a few of the transition metals right here, these, no, and most of the, um, of the other representative elements. And then there are only two down here in the actinide group that I want you to know, and that's for historical purposes. Uh, uranium, of course, because it um, destroyed Hiroshima at the end of World War II, and plutonium, which destroyed Nagasaki uh, at the end of the same war. Uh, the rest of them, you'll see that there's some in here that are not marked off. I don't require that you know those. You can memorize them if you want to, but I'd focus on the ones that are the red box ones. You'll also notice that some of them have blue boxes around them, like these. Now that's not right. That one should that one shouldn't be blue. That's a mistake. I mean, let me correct that on my document so I can fix it. Uh, now I'm going to take one of these. That blue box means they're diatomic. And helium is not diatomic. 
Helium is a noble gas, and noble gases don't play with anybody. They're all by themselves. So that should, when you write these um, under normal conditions, we consider room temperature and, and one atmosphere pressure, then these will always be two together, H2, N2, O2, F2, Cl2, Br2, I2. Those are all diatomic. So when you read a word problem and it says oxygen reacts with hydrogen, you know that both of those have to be diatomic, H2 and O2. If you don't write them that way, then you won't balance the equation. Okay, so there are all your symbols. Let's see. Um, just a second. Go back to my PowerPoints here. All right. <clears throat> Apparently, I don't have a slide on there for why they're named the way they are. But notice that they all have at least one symbol. If there's only one letter, it's capitalized. If there are two letters, then the first one's capital and the second one's small. That was proposed by um, a Swedish chemist back in the early, was a mid 18th century, I think, or late 18th century. His name was Berzelius. And uh, there were one or two other competing proposals for representing the elements with symbols. And it's a good thing that Brazilius won out because the others were just off the wall. They were more alchemists versions than they were uh, chemists. So you're going to have, uh, let's say, for instance, boron is B. If there's any other element that needs a B in it, then it has to have two letters like beryllium right? or uh, barium or bromine. Um, most of them, the symbols can be associated with the English words. But there are a few that are derived from the Latin. For instance, Na is sodium. But the Latin for sodium is natrum. So that's where Na comes from. K is uh, potassium, and the Latin is calium with a K. So you find several of those in here. Um, let's see, let's go across here. Iron, Fe for ferrum. Copper is almost understandable, but it's actually derived from cooper. Uh, silver is Ag for argentum, and gold is Au for aurum. And let's see, there's some others. Oh, uh, my favorite is PB. PB is, is lead. It's from the Latin word plumbum, which means heavy. <clears throat> okay, so you'll find a few of those in there like that. All right, when we look at the distribution of these elements in the, uh, in the Earth's uh, crust, that includes oceans and atmosphere, all these. The distribution is primarily oxygen. Oxygen is almost 50% of everything we find uh, by mass. So hydrogen is not prominent, partly because it's so light. But there's a lot of hydrogen atoms out there simply because the Earth is a water world, H2O. But it's also got oxygen, plus oxygen. Most of the elements in the Earth's crust are combined with oxygen. You find them in, in oxide ores, like um, iron ore would look like this. That would be the part of the ore that you want to isolate and then smelt out the iron. Uh, aluminum. Right. comes from the bauxite ore. 
So, and silicon dioxide, of course, you walk on any beach and your toes are just squishing through lots of silicon dioxide. So that's why one of the reasons that silicon is uh, the second most common element by mass on earth. And then it goes down from there. Okay, what do we mean when we say element? We've been using that term element, but haven't defined it. We sort of have an intuition of what an element is, but we need a, a, a definite, or well, a definition. An element is um, a unique substance that cannot be divided any further, cannot be separated into more than one substance. In other words, if you have uh, the element, a chunk of iron, you can't get silicon out of it. You can't get other elements. You can't get other identifiable uh, substances that are also unique. Iron is unique. Now, the simplest uh, unit of the element is the atom. You can keep subdividing and subdividing, divide in half, divide in half, divide in half. Eventually, you get down to two atoms, divide, you got one atom. The atom of this element is the simplest form that retains the identity of the element. Both chemical and physical properties are. Um, the, that atom is endowed with those physical and chemical properties that are common to the element. And they're different than any other element. Now, there are similarities among elements, but none exactly like that. It is unique. Sometimes, like I mentioned earlier, elements occur associated uh, two or more atoms together. So the diatomic elements are exactly that. Um, uh, H2 is a good example. You can also have um, various allotropes of sulfur. You could have uh, uh, eight atoms of sulfur combined together. It's still the sulfur element. Or you could have um, four atoms of phosphorus combined together. It's still phosphorus. Okay. Now these elements, it doesn't matter where you find them. They still have their properties. So if you find sodium on the table in your, in your salt shaker, it's combined with chlorine, of course, but it's still sodium as the element. Or you can find sodium in your body like when doctors uh, do uh, blood analysis, the analysis is returned in a form that gives them um, electrolytes, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and some other anions, that is negative ion. So it doesn't matter where you find them, it's still sodium. All right. So I mentioned these symbols before. We're not going to beat that horse again. You always have one or two letters. And they're derived either from, um, they can be associated with English. I'm not so sure that they were originally designed for English because the common language among scientists at the time that the system was proposed was Latin. So it's probably uh, the sequence of events probably derived most of the elements from Latin, and then there were some oddballs. So we think in reverse, since we speak English, then we look for ones that uh, can be associated with English, and the rest of them are oddballs. They're derived from Latin or Greek. Okay, so this is an alphabetical listing of the elements. And you should find this in your textbook. 
you'll need that when you're filling out the uh, extra credit, uh, getting to know your periodic table, this one right here. Because the, the periodic table that I, I give you to know the elements doesn't have the names with it. So you gotta look up the names and that's also an exercise in memory. But this is one place you can find it, alphabetical listing. Okay, so let's look at some significant discoveries over the centuries that have led to an understanding of chemistry. Now the heading up here is Dalton's atomic theory. That's where we're that's where we're going to end up. But first, we need to look at some laws. Remember, laws just say what happens. It doesn't say why. When we get to a theory, Dalton's atomic theory explains all of these laws. So the first one of significance was the law of conservation of mass. And it was proposed by Lavoisier in the late 18th century. It simply says that during a chemical reaction, Matter is not created and it's not destroyed. In other words, in our modern terms, we would say the mass of the reactants is equal to the mass of the products. But Lavoisier didn't know why. He had no clue. All they knew in those days was just mass, mass of elements. They didn't know about individual particles, atoms, molecules, and so forth. So unfortunately, Lavoisier uh, lived for a while <laughs> until the French Revolution. And he was also a, uh, he had bought a contract from the, from the uh, king to collect taxes in a certain region of France. And in those days, if you're a tax collector, you can collect as much as you want from the people. The king requires a certain amount, you keep the rest. So whether he did that or not, uh, everybody hated tax collectors. And when the opportunity presented itself during the reign of terror in, uh, at the, in the French Revolution, Lavoisier was one of those who lost his head. Okay, next, a little bit later, a couple of decades later, uh, Joseph Proust came up with this proposition, the law of constant composition, or you might often see it definite proportions. All it says is that no matter where a compound originates, what is its source doesn't matter. Once you've identified and purified that compound, it will have the same relative amounts of, by mass, of the elements in it, no matter what its source. So for instance, if we, uh, Capture the exhaust of the space shuttle when it's going up. It takes hydrogen gas and oxygen gas and produces water. And of course, at those temperatures, that's going to be a gas too. So um, let's see, let me balance this. So when you combine these two to get water, it doesn't matter that the water came from that source. It's water no matter what its origin. We can also get water from acid based reactions. You can say sodium hydroxide, which is actually in water, and hydrochloric acid yield sodium chloride, aqueous, aqueous. By the way, these suffixes in parentheses, they stand for the state, if I haven't already said that. Gases, this is aqueous solutions. Now we could say L for liquids or S for solids. And this will also have water. So once you've got this and isolated this compound, you can't tell where it came from. It's always the same composition, no matter what its origin. That's the law of definite proportions, or your book calls it constant composition. OK. 
okay? It always has that ratio, oxygen to hydrogen in those eight grams of oxygen for every gram of hydrogen. Carbon dioxide, whatever its source is, same thing. Any compound has the same ratio by mass, no matter what its origin. Okay, then along comes a little bit later, about a decade later, uh, John Dalton. Same one that proposed the theory. And what he said was, uh, in this law of multiple proportions, he said that if you have a uh, binary compound, that is one that's composed of two different elements, and they, they, they can form different compounds, identifiable compounds. Our example here is, nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and nitrogen trioxide. He said, and he didn't know this at the time, of course, but he also said that um, if you hold the mass of one of them constant, say we have enough nitrogen monoxide to have one gram of nitrogen, same thing for nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen trioxide, one gram of nitrogen only, then the ratio, of uh, the second element are whole numbers. So if you have, uh, let's see, the ratio for this one would be uh, 14 to 16. Okay. And the ratio for this one would be, let's see. 14 to 32. And this one would be 14 to 48. Notice that the ratios are whole numbers. If this is one, this is two times that, and this is three times that. Okay? That's what Dalton said. The law of multiple proportions. He was homing in on the fact that this is due to the ratio of number of atoms combined in that compound. And that's what going to be one of his proposals in this atomic theory. Okay. So before we get to Dalton's atomic theory, there are some items that we need to uh, clarify. Most naturally occurring materials are mixtures. And you can, you can separate them by physical means into pure substances. Uh, for instance, if you have uh, salt water, you have sodium chloride dissolved in water, you can separate the two simply by evaporating the water. You just physical means, boil it, whatever, or let it sit out on the counter for several weeks. Eventually, you'll end up with sodium chloride, and if you want to, you can catch the, the steam if you're boiling it and condense it. Now you have the water. So they can be separated. Pure substances can be separated by physical means. They're mixtures, and that's the way they occur in nature. Very seldom do you have pure substances in nature. Um, I think gold nuggets might qualify as a pure substance. But even, even gold that you find um, in the Klondike of uh, Alaska, or actually the Klondike of Canada, Western Canada, uh, that gold has inclusions of other pure substances. Now, a pure substance can either be an element, right? if it's a pure element, or it can be a compound. So we haven't, we haven't identified what's the difference between uh, a compound and an element. Well, for instance, two hydrogen atoms combined together is not a compound. You have to have at least two or more different elements. So this would be a compound. It has hydrogen and oxygen. 
but that is still an element. Now, this is just a, a repeating uh, proof law of constant composition or definite proportions. Now we get to Dalton's atomic theory. What Dalton tried to do was he tried to explain all of these uh, laws that had accumulated over the decades. And his proposal was, actually his first proposal was borrowed from the ancient Greeks. Elements are made of tiny particles called atoms. Now the ancient, there were certain ancient Greeks who believed this also. Unfortunately, they were in the minority. Most of the ancient Greeks were with Aristotle. They believed that everything was made of uh, the four basic elements, you know, earth, wind, water, and fire. Well, they were all wrong. And the ones who believed in the atom were actually homing in on the truth. They weren't quite there yet. Right? The Greek word atom, A is a prefix that means not. It's just opposite of whatever the root is. And tomos is Greek for cut or divide. So the atom is something that you can't cut. You can't make it any smaller. It's the simplest possible substance. The ancient Greeks believed that everything was made of the same atom. And that got them into trouble because they couldn't explain how you get different pure substances or different compounds from the same atom. So they had to invent stuff. Um, but eventually this idea trickled down to the early 19th century and Dalton hit upon it. And what he said that was the elements were indeed made of tiny particles called atoms, but he went one step further. He said, all the atoms of a given element are identical, but the atoms of one element are different than the atoms of other elements. That solved that whole problem that the ancient Greeks had in two statements. <clears throat> Now, they didn't know what made up an atom. They thought it was just a, like a, a ball, you know, a billiard ball. You'd have ones and twos and threes and fours and uh, that eight ball. They didn't know what was inside yet. They, but Dalton proposed that they were different. He also proposed that atoms of one element can combine with atoms of another element to make compounds. So now he's getting at the, the heart of why um, the compounds have definite mass ratios. That's because they have so many of uh, different elements, uh, atoms combined with others. The ratio of atoms is what makes the mass constant and the, the composition constant. He also said that during a chemical reaction, the atoms just rearrange themselves. They switch partners. So that explains the conservation of mass. Because if all you do is rearrange partners, you still got the same number of atoms as reactants and products. So he actually, with this theory, he explained all those previous laws that we have described up to this point. Okay. Now, this slide actually is, I think it's out of order. It's something that should come a little later, but it's here, so we'll talk about it. So which one of these are still true? Elements are made of tiny particles called atoms. Yep, that's still true. All atoms of a given element are identical. Um, that's not true anymore. 
simply because we know about isotopes now. And I'll, we'll have to describe isotopes in a few minutes, I hope. A given compound always has the same relative numbers and types of atoms. That is true. That has not changed. And atoms are indestructible. Well, we didn't include that as one of Dalton's postulates. But it was. He believed that atoms were indestructible and you couldn't make uh, a different element atom out of another atom. In other words, you cannot transmutate lead into gold, for instance. But we know now that atoms are destructible. They can be broken apart in nuclear reactions. Right. So those two are still true. Uh, just a second, let me check something. Okay, we'll eventually get there. Okay, so now that we have symbols for elements, we can describe the structure of a compound simply by using the element symbol and a uh, subscript for how many there are in the compound. Um, when we write an element, the symbol for an element, say we have I'm going to use X because there's, there's no element in the periodic table that uses X. So that's my generic symbol. There are four positions here that are reserved for information. This position is reserved for charge. So you say plus, minus, two plus, two minus, three plus, three minus, whatever the case may be. This one is for the number of atoms. Okay. This side is for our topics that we haven't covered yet, but I'm going to give them to you anyway right now and just keep that in the back of your mind. This designated Z is the atomic number. It is unique for every element. If you have a different atomic number, you've got a different element. And that's because this is equal to the number of protons. This one is the mass number. And it's equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Now I have to flesh out that story here in a few minutes. So when we write a compound, we just write the symbol for the element that's in the compound and how many atoms there are in that compound. The simplest ratio. So for sodium chloride, it would be one sodium and one chlorine. Or for, let's pick something else. Uh, for, that's, that's the gas that kills from exhaust, uh, automobile exhaust, carbon monoxide. So it just takes one and one. And notice we don't have any uh, subscripts here because if you have the element symbol, you've got at least one. So writing one down there will be redundant. So that's an example of a chemical formula. Now they come in two flavors. They can either be uh, ionic in form, or they can be molecular in form. This is ionic because uh, in salt that you can pour into your hand, you've got lots of these but they're individual ions. Whereas carbon monoxide is a gas, and these things are bound in such a way that the carbon and oxygen act as a single unit. We'll talk about that a little more uh, as we progress. So this example says you have one sulfur atom and three oxygen atoms combined together. Okay. It's fairly simple, actually. Simpler is better. For chemists and scientists in general, the simpler, the better. In fact, we've got a word for it. We call it elegant. 
Simple theories are elegant. Okay, uh, example, this uh, pesticide DDT was once used worldwide and it wiped out malaria. No malaria cases at all until the environmentalists got hold of it and said, um, bird eggs are cracking because of DDT is accumulating and uh, the shells are too thin and we're gonna lose those populations. So that among other things, uh, prompted governments all over the world to ban DDT. Um, so then the malaria cases skyrocketed again and many deaths. But the molecule itself has 14 carbon atoms, nine hydrogen and five chlorine. So how would you write that? Just like this, 14 carbons, nine hydrogens, five chlorines. Now we're going to look at the structure of the atom. Um, actually, in the actually early 18th century, people were experimenting with electricity. Some scientists were, but a lot of party goers were. Electricity was a fascinating concept. And they had both batteries and electrostatic devices that they would uh, keep in their salons. And then during parties, um, they shock each other with them. It was actually thought to be healthy to receive an electric shock. Um, but some scientists eventually wanted to know what this was all about, right? So J.G. Thompson did some experiments with a, with a new device called the cathode ray. It's a, a, a fully or partially evacuated tube with a cathode on one end and an anode on the other end. And the cathode was negatively charged, the anode was positively charged, and you could, with a high enough voltage, you could get, uh, you could see a beam if there was enough gas left in the tube, a beam between one and the other. And Thompson wanted to understand what that was composed of. So he did some experiments with his cathode ray and he determined that the particles that were being transferred from one electrode to the other were negatively charged. And he called them electrons. He also noticed that it didn't matter what the composition of the electrode was, the behavior of his electrons was always the same. So he concluded that electrons were common to all elements. They were derived, they were extracted from every element he could put in his cathode ray. So that's what it looked like. And all you had to do was bring, uh, create an electric field close to this, and you'd see the beam bend. And they knew about electric fields, what was the positive side, what was the negative side, and it always bent toward the positive. And it would do the same thing in magnetic fields. So they concluded that these were negatively charged particles. He also determined the ratio of the charge to the mass. Now he didn't have the uh, expertise or the instrumentation at that time to determine the actual mass of the electron, but he did determine that ratio charge to mass. And he proposed that since electrons come from any source, they must be common to every element. Then he proposed that the, the electron was part of the atom, but he didn't know what the positive part was. He said these atoms, these electrons, were solid particles. I mean, they, they were real. Um, but they were surrounded by a positive charge matrix of indefinite composition. And that's why we call it his plum pudding model. 
uh, because it looked like uh, the English plum pudding. Well, there's a picture up there. Okay. He knew that the positive charges had to be there because um, neutral substances existed. In other words, if you know you've got electric uh, negative charge coming from that substance, there has to be positive in there somewhere to balance the charge. But he didn't know what it was yet. Well, um, along comes Robert Milliken. He was um, uh, an American scientist. At this time, he was working at the University of Chicago as a full professor. And um, he wanted to investigate this phenomenon, what this electron was. And he created the instrument, uh, which was an evacuated chamber with sight glasses through it. So he could watch what was going on inside. And he, he uh, created a fine mist of oil drops and they drifted down through an electric field between the plates. There was a hole in the top of one of them. And he would adjust the field strength and he would get one of those oil droplets to be stationary. He had to look at it with a telescope from outside, but he knew how much charge was required to stop that droplet. He knew the mass of the droplet. So he could tell um, the, um, the size of the charge. So that's what he was after first. Well, it would vary because oil droplets might accumulate one electron, two electrons, three electrons, but they're always whole number multiples of each other. And he determined that the smallest whole number that would account for all of them was a, a single charge. And he called that the elementary charge of the electron. And then he used that charge plus J.J. Thompson's charge to mass ratio to determine the mass of the electron. And he was pretty close. Okay, so he determined that the charge on a single electron is this. In these units, coulombs, uh, you don't need to know what those are right now, but um, they were a recognized unit of measure for charge. And then he calculated the mass to be 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Actually, it's almost 10, so it's closer to 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. It's, it's still pretty small. And for this, he, he received the uh, Nobel Prize in physics in 1923. Uh, well, he also, it was like a, a dual award. He also verified uh, Einstein's photoelectric effect description for which Einstein received the Nobel Prize in 1921, I think. Okay, so we know what the electron is. We know how big it is, but that didn't explain the mass of the atom. The electron is just way too small. So the rest of that mass had to be proton and maybe something else. So that's what Ernst Rutherford, an Englishman, set about to discover what is the nature of that positive charge. And he proposed that the positive charge was also a particle called the proton. And compared to the electron, it was extremely massive. It was at least five orders of magnitude more massive, 10,000 times. Actually, it wasn't that big. It was uh, about 1,800 times more massive than the uh, electron. But he didn't subscribe to the plum pudding model. He thought that the uh, the proton was concentrated in the center of the atom and the electrons were out here somewhere. He called it his nuclear atom. So he proposed an experiment to tell the difference between the plum pudding or the nuclear model. By this time, he needed something massive enough to fire at the atoms so that he could detect any deflection. With the plum pudding model, with negatives here, and here, and here, and here, and then positives scattered throughout, if he fired some massive particle, 
they would basically might slow down a little bit, but they would end up over here in that space right there. No deflection. He said with his model, if he fired something at the nucleus with the positive charge and the mass of the nucleus concentrated here, then most of them would end up over there because the nucleus would have to be very small. But occasionally, one would come along and hit like this and bounce off, and his detector would pick it up. Or sometimes they'd come in and bounce straight back. So he had to put detectors all the way around the target. Okay. So. What kind of target would suffice? Well, the target he used was gold foil. Okay. He used gold foil for two reasons. They knew in those days exactly how to make very thin sheets of gold, just a few atoms thick, which was great because if you have too many atoms stacked in there, then nothing's getting through. And he wanted things to go through uh, except for when they hit the nucleus. Plus, uh, he needed a very heavy atom, a large atom. The gold was perfect for that. It has... Uh, 79 protons in its nucleus. So now he needed a bullet. He needs something to fire at that target. And by this time, radioactivity had been identified in three forms. It was either gamma rays, which was high energy light. That wouldn't work. It's not a particle. Um, there were beta particles, which were actually high speed electrons. They weren't massive enough. And the third one, the alpha particle, was perfect. The alpha particle was actually a helium nucleus. So he got his radioactive source in this lead lined container, and he used that to fire alpha particles at the gold foil. And sure enough, most of them went through but a few of them were deflected. So that is how uh, Rutherford disproved the plum pudding model and supported his nuclear model. Okay. Um, unfortunately, the mass of the proton combined with the electron was not sufficient to account for the mass of every element. In fact, it can only account for the mass of one element, hydrogen, because hydrogen only had one proton in its nucleus. But everything else had too much mass. Protons couldn't explain it. Well, they can't go for a charged particle because it's already neutral with the number of protons and electrons balancing the charge. It had to be something else in the nucleus that was almost as actually more massive slightly than protons, but no charge. So the proposal there was that we're going to call it a neutron. It has no charge, but it's massive and it's there in the nucleus. Well, it was uh, Rutherford's uh, assistant, let's see, I'm going to skip that because I don't want to run out of time. In fact, I'm probably running close. Uh, Rutherford. And then, well, I thought I had the other guy in here too. His name was uh, Cavendish. He was a research associate of Rutherford. And he said about the, for, to discover what this particle was and they determined it to be a neutron. They actually identified the neutron. And um, then if you include neutrons in the mix, then you can account for all of the mass of the atom. Now, what cabbage? 
escapes me for the moment. Okay, so we progress through Dalton's solid atom, to Thompson's plum pudding model, to Rutherford's nuclear atom. So we're, we're getting closer to the truth. Now the modern concept of the atom actually doesn't treat electrons as particles anymore. It actually treats them as waves. But we find ourselves in, the, in a dilemma here, similar to the, the uh, controversy that erupted over what is light. Because in some circumstances, light behaves as a wave. Other circumstances, it behaves as a particle. You can say the same thing about electrons or about any mass, any atom, as a matter of fact. They all have wave properties in addition to their particle properties. So now we describe electrons in terms of their uh, energies as waves. And as a consequence, we can never say exactly where they are located and their energy at the same time. So we have to speak of electrons in terms of the probabilities. What's the probability of finding an electron in this space around an atom? If the probability is very high, then we sort of draw a, a um, electron density cloud to represent where the electron might be. And that sounds nebulous, but actually it explains the behavior of atoms in chemical reactions much better than looking at them in these other terms. Okay. Chadwick, there you go. Chadwick was the research associate that discovered the neutron. Okay. And coincidentally, uh, he got a Nobel Prize for that one too. Okay, so now we know the atom contains electrons, protons, and neutrons. Okay, the nucleus is extremely small compared to the size of the atom. Most of the space is taken up by electrons somewhere out here. And when you consider chemical reactions, when two atoms come together to react, what do they see first? They see electrons. Their electrons interact first. So all that space out there is occupied by electrons at various energy levels and they, they interact in ways that we're going to discuss as time progresses. Okay, so there's, if the electron is, is one, then proton is 1836 and the neutron is 1839. And they're the charges. And I mentioned this, the chemistry arises from the interaction of electrons. That's where the bonds take place. So it's the number of electrons in the outermost regions, we call the valence shell of an atom that are responsible for chemical reactions. Okay, we know about isotopes now. If you have a certain number of protons, you have a given element, but you can have different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus and still have the same element because its behavior is determined by uh, both its mass and its electronic structure, how the electrons behave. And the neutrons have nothing to do with that. Well, very little to do with that. Um, most elements in nature are composed of two or more isotopes. An isotope is simply an atom, two atoms or more with the same number of protons and different numbers of neutrons. Those are isotopes.
So um, there's our symbol. And here's the description I gave you earlier. We just left out the charge and the number of, of atoms. Now, um, let's see. Okay, here's an example. You've heard of carbon-14 dating. Right? Carbon-14 is a radioactive element and it, it decays. In other words, it changes. In other words, it becomes a different element. And in the process, um, it changes its number of protons and neutrons, so it has to become a different element. But this is only one isotope of carbon. The major isotope of carbon is, let's see, there, carbon-12. That's the most common form. Um, and it's a stable isotope. It does, it has, it does not decay. Right? They both have the same number of protons, but they have different numbers of neutrons. And that leads to instability. It only needs six neutrons to be stable. It's got eight, which means that it, it's going to be unstable. Now, not all cases where you have extra neutrons will lead to instability, but in this case, it does. All right, so let's, let's look at this potential problem. An isotope X contains 23 protons and 28 neutrons. 23 protons. So we put it there. 28 neutrons means what's this number? It's the sum of the two, 51. So our element is 23Z and 51A. So what's the question? The mass number we said, okay, it's 51. What's the element? Go to your periodic table. They're arranged from top to bottom and left to right, increasing numbers of protons, atomic number. Um, and you can find your element that way. Just follow along until you find 23, and it turns out to be vanadium. Okay. Now, how about the periodic table? Where did it come from? Well, it was a long slog, <clears throat> but eventually a Russian, actually there was a German and a Russian that sort of were working on the same problem at the same time. Lothar Meyer was the German and um, Dmitry Mendeleev was the Russian. So they proposed a periodic table uh, that organize the elements uh, according to their, originally according to their atomic weights, what they understood to be the weights. But uh, Mendeleev understood, and this is his, his first proposition, his first proposed table. This was a later version. What Mendeleev said, was that it's not just the atomic weight that matters, it's the chemical and physical properties of the elements. He noticed that there were, they could be grouped. Some elements behave similarly to others, so he put them in families or groups. And when he came to a place where there should be an increment in mass for another element, and if he put that element in that place, it didn't have the same properties as the group it was in. He said, that can't be. There must be a missing element there. So he moved it over to the next group where it did have common properties. And he left a hole there. But the genius of the, uh, Mendeleev was he predicted both the mass and the chemical and physical properties of the element that would go in that place. And eventually it was found. 
So that's why Mendeleev uh, gets the lion's share of the credit for the periodic table, because he used it to predict the existence of undiscovered elements. And you'll see here, there are several holes. He left those holes in place when he published his table. Okay, so this is what our table looks like now, except these placeholders have real names. And uh, I placed those in that, that table that um, with the red squares. You don't have to memorize any of them, but they are there. And the table is organized this way so that um, we can use it to extract information. All right, let's look at, well, the atomic number actually is an interesting story. We know now that the atomic number is the number of protons, but originally the atomic number was associated with X-ray diffraction of elements by um, a young chemist named Mosley. He was interested in um, X-ray spectra. He would fire X-rays at elements and then um, measure the wavelength of the uh, that they emitted afterwards. And he noticed that he could predict the wavelength of each of these elements with a, the same formula. He had some kind of formula here, and he could predict the wavelength. And all he had to change in that formula was one factor. It could be one, two, three, four, five. Always whole numbers would do it. And that was the atomic number originally. We have since associated those atomic numbers with the number of protons, but that's, that's how it started. Unfortunately, Mosley was pretty clever. He was a, he's a good experimental chemist, um, but he volunteered to go to World War I for his country, England, and he, he died in that war. So that was the end of his career. Okay, so the periodic table can be subdivided into various regions and groups and periods for that matter, and we'll define what those are. Metals versus non-metals, uh, groups and periods. Okay, let's move on to the table and make more sense. Okay, so here you have metals and non-metals. Metals are over here, all this region left of that black line, right? It starts here, goes between boron and aluminum, and then stair steps down. So everything to the right is non-metal, everything to the left is metal. Most of the elements in the periodic table are considered metals. But there are a few very close to this line. Under certain circumstances, they behave like metals, and under other circumstances, they behave like non-metals. They're called metalloids for that reason. Now we also have groups and on the modern periodic table, groups are arranged vertically. So everything in this group has similar behavior. These are the noble gases, right? They don't play with anybody. These are the halogens. They have similar characteristics. The oxygen group are known as the calcogens, C-H-A-L. C O G E N, calcogen. The nitrogen group is known as nictogens, P N P N I C T O G E N. And then over here we have the alkaline metals and the alkaline earths. Okay, and then everything in between here are the transition metals. Now these two groups. The lanthanides and the actinides are named for the first element in their series. 
So take all of these and cram them right in here. Notice this goes 57, 72. All of these go right in that crack. We pull them out because that shrinks the length of the periodic table. Those are lanthanides. These are the actinides. There's actinium. And this group goes right in there. So uranium and plutonium are actinides. All right. So what are we going to say about this? Oh, well, this is a different table organized like that. Oh, we didn't say anything about periods. Okay, what's a period? <clears throat> a period is a row. What they noticed was, and what um, Mendeleev noticed, was that he's putting these elements as they get heavier and heavier, he's putting them in their groups. Okay. But he noticed that when he gets down past the noble gases, He's got a heavier element down here, but it behaves like one over here. So he wrapped around and started over again. So that's what period means. Periodically, he goes back to the beginning, starts over. All right. Okay. Most elements in their pure state are very reactive. That's why you don't find pure elements in nature very often. Very seldom do you find them. Uh, uncombined elements. The noble gases, uh, the noble gases, of course, there are noble metals, gold, platinum, to a certain extent, silver, but silver will react and, and is found uh, in its ores reacted with. <coughs> Chlorides, sulfides, no gases, of course, they don't react. And then some gases that we find in the atmosphere, particularly nitrogen and oxygen, of course, in the air we breathe, um, are unreactive as gases, but when we take them into our bodies, they're, they're easily react, oxygen easily reacts with things. We use oxygen in that way, but nitrogen, we don't. Nitrogen goes into our body, one comes back out as nitrogen. Unless, of course, you deep dive, and then nitrogen gets dissolved in your tissues under pressure. And if you come up too quick, it comes out of solution and accumulates in, in your organs and in your joints and when you have the bends. But it's not because nitrogen reacts. It's purely physical property. Okay, we can find elements, sometimes we can find pure elements in nature existing in different forms. Perfect example is carbon. Carbon can be found in pure form as a diamond, okay. or it can be found as graphite. They're different physical arrangements of carbon atoms, but they're still pure carbon elements. And then there was one created. Buckminster fullerene was a, uh, sometimes we call them buckyballs. They're actually 60 carbons uh, in the form of, of a sphere. Think if you've ever seen pictures or been to Disney World in Florida, the geodesic dome there in uh, in uh, oh, which which section is that in? World of Tomorrow, something like that. Anyway, uh, it forms a perfect sphere of sixty carbons, but there are also other forms, carbon nanotubes, which are created. Okay, this is what they look like. Diamond is a perfect tetrahedron arrangement, whereas okay. nanotubes, okay. these are all very strongly bound to carbon atoms bound. 
Um, diamond is a tetrahedron, right? So this carbon is bound to four others, carbons at each one of these positions. Whereas um, graphite is a hexagon. It sits in layers. So between layers, there are very weak bonds, but within the layers, there are very strong bonds. Okay, so how do we form an ion? Well, we know how to write an element. We know that neutral elements have the same number of protons and the same number of electrons. So if we change that ratio, we get an ion. But how do we change the ratio? That's the key. If we change the ratio of positive to negative by changing the number of protons, then we get a different element. So we can't mess with the protons. The balance has to be in either acquiring electrons or giving up electrons. If we do that, then we can shift the balance toward the negative or the positive, as the case may be. Most metals give up electrons, so they become positive ions. And those positive ions are called cations. Um, many nonmetals prefer to receive or accept electrons, so they form negative ions. And they're called anions. Okay. This chlorine is a good example. All the halogens tend to accept one electron. All right. Some of the groups in the periodic table only acquire, when they form ions, they only acquire a certain single charge. Well, a certain given charge, I should say. The alkaline metals, the first group to your left, they always charge to one plus. So sodium is an example. Potassium. Uh, lithium. They always form one plus charge. Their next door neighbors, alkaline earths, always form two plus charge. Right? So, um, I don't know, magnesium or calcium, like that, uh, beryllium, they always form a two plus charge. So count from the left, first group is one plus, second group is two plus. Halogens, on the other hand, tend to accept electrons. So they all form one minus charge. And of course, noble gases don't charge at all. So, um, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, they all form them, one minus charge. So since they, they do that, then if you combine one of these metals with one of these, then you know the charge that they're going to form, right? Sodium, one sodium always combines with one chlorine. Or one calcium always combines with two fluorines, right? Because you need two minuses to make up the difference, two pluses. All compounds that form are neutral. So we have to balance the charges. All right. So these are fixed charge elements. I mentioned these, mentioned those, but in this group over here, starting with boron. These, boron, aluminum, gallium, indium, they're all three plus charge. And if we start from the right, the halogens are minus one, the calcogens are two minuses, the nitrogens are three minuses, down to phosphorus. Now, everybody else has the potential for forming multiple charges. So we have to account for those uh, in the next chapter.
Let's see. I'm going to run out of time, so I better. Let me see how much time I got left. I got about 10 minutes. I'm not going to finish getting the. I'm going to have to record chapter five. So if, if you if you can stay fine, if you can't, then um, I'll finish chapter five and it'll be recorded. All right. So let's see if we can use what we know now to identify an ion. It has a three plus charge and it has 23 electrons. Okay, so how do we identify the element? We need to find out the number of protons. So if it's a three plus charge, that means it has three more positive charges than negative charges because it favors the three pluses. So that means this one has to be 26 protons. Okay. Three extra pluses to the minuses. Now we can find out the element. 26 is what? Turns out to be iron. There you go. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Compounds that contain ions are always metal, non-metal. Sodium chloride is a good example. The crystals, if you look at uh, table salts built on the table with the magnifying glass, you'll see these little cubes. Those cubes are an indicator of how the sodium and chlorine are arranged in that crystal structure. Ionic compounds have very high melting points, extremely high melting points. They only conduct electricity if they're melted or they're dissolved in some fluid, usually water. Why is that? In the crystal structure, those ions are locked in place. They cannot move. So if you try to apply a charge, across a crystal of sodium chloride, you get nothing because there's nothing there to carry the charge. It's only when the charge is freed up and made mobile by melting or by dissolution in water that those charges are now able to carry from one electrode to the other. They're always electrically neutral. You have to balance the charges. For example, magnesium chloride. You've got one negative for chlorine, but you've got two for magnesium. So it takes two chlorines to balance the one magnesium. That's why the formula is MgCl2. All right. Uh, I guess we should do this one. So a compound is composed of X and two chlorine. So one of these combines with two of those. Well, we know that these have a minus charge each. So they have two minuses together. That means this one has to have two plus. Okay, we know that. And what else are we given? X contains 20 electrons. 20 electrons. So how does it get two pluses? It needs two more protons than electrons. So 22 protons means what? We have titanium with 22 protons like that. But you don't have to write that in there. When you write a compound, uh, only when you're talking about nuclear activities do you need to fill those two spots on the left? Right, well, it asks us what's the identity of X. Well, X is the two plus ion of titanium. 
That's what X is. All right, I'm going to skip this one and move on to chapter five. Naming compounds. Naming compounds is basically memorizing the rules. So we're talking about nomenclature, which is naming compounds. Let's see. I'm checking to see if anybody else is. No, nope, just us. Okay. So when you name a compound, we're going to start really simple. The simplest form of compound is binary. That is, it has two elements. Okay. We're going to start off with binary ionic compounds. In other words, we know that the, there's a, a cation, there's at least one cation, at least one anion combined, sometimes more. So they're always composed of metals and nonmetals because the cations form from metals and the anions form from the nonmetals. Then we're going to talk about covalent compounds, binary covalent compounds. They form from two nonmetals. And I'll explain why in a minute. Okay. So these binary ionic compounds form from metal and non-metal. In this case, sodium is from group one, chlorine is from group seven. Now let's talk about the three types for the binary naming system. Three types. First type. Type one, metal, non-metal. The metals always come from groups that have fixed charge. So the metal is always a fixed charge. That means it comes from groups one, two, three, that's it. And there are a couple of transition metals that have fixed charge. The um, silver is always plus one and copper, oh, excuse me, not copper, zinc. Zinc is always two pluses. So if it comes from one of these three groups, Alkaline metals, alkaline earths, or the boron group, or silver or zinc. It has a fixed charge. That's type one. How do you name those? You put the cation first, that is the positive, the metal. So you have the cation attached, and then the anion you name. And the anion always changes the end of its element name to IDE. So that's why we say sodium, just name the cation. And then instead of chlorine, we say chloride. All right, so here's a case. There's chloride, bromide, iodide. If oxygen is involved, it's oxide. Sulfurs, sulfide. Um, now, if hydrogen is bound to a metal, then it acquires a minus one charge, which means then you say hy uh, hydride. So um, let's see. Lithium hydride. Lithium is always a plus one, so hydrogen has to be a minus one. All right, that's type one compound. Type two 
let's see, uh, naming type one, excuse me. Uh, cation is always named first, then the anion with an IDE changed on its end, on the, the end of the root. Examples, notice that we're balancing the charge. And one thing that's common to the type one compounds is you don't have to say how many there are because the charges are fixed. We can count, we can figure how many there are. Right? Potassium chloride simply means there's one potassium and one chlorine because their charges are fixed. To balance, you only need one of each. Whereas magnesium bromide, Magnesium is always two plus, bromine is minus one, so we know that we need two bromines, right? So it would be redundant to say magnesium dibromide. We don't say that. Okay, uh, let's see. Now, what do we do with type two? They're also metal and non-metal, but the charge on the metal is variable. That means that when the compound forms, it can be one of two or more different charges. After the compound forms, it doesn't change. But before, there are possibilities. Like, for instance, iron. Iron can be... Uh, a two plus charge or a three plus charge. So what do you do with that? I mean, it's not fixed. So how do you tell? Well, uh, most of these are transition metals. But there are some representatives. Elements. Representative elements are the ones that are in these first two columns and all of these over here. So right in here, they're not transition elements, but they do have the potential for multiple charges, some of them. Like for instance, lead. Lead can be a two plus charge or a four plus charge. Tin, SN, can be a two plus charge or a four plus charge. So it would fit in this type two category. So what do you do? Well, when you name the compound, if you are given the formula, like this one, like that, you calculate the charge on the metal. Oxygen, we know, is always two minus. So that means this iron has to be two plus. So then how you name it? Well, similarly to type one, you say iron oxide. But now you have to say what the charge is. So the charge on iron is Roman numeral two or two plus. If we have the same compound, let's say I did this one. Instead of that, we say iron three oxide. Let's write the compound for that. Well, you know you got iron and oxygen, correct? Iron. Oxygen, oxygen always two minus. Iron in this case is three plus. So how do you match an odd charge to an even charge? Cross multiply. Put the three over here and the two over there. Now, does that, and check yourself. Three times two is six minus. And two times three plus is six plus. We're balanced. Okay, that's the only difference. You have to say what the charge is on the metal. All right. Examples. Let's see. Um, okay, let's do this one too. What's the correct name of the compound that results from the most stable ion of sulfur? Where does sulfur come from? 
It's a non-metal. So it's the second element in the, in the formula. And it's combined with a metal that contains 24 electrons. So this is two minus. This one has 24 electrons. So we have to assume, that's the problem with this, we have to assume that there's only one of these. So if there's only one of these, it has a two plus charge, which means it has to be 26 protons. And 26 protons is iron. So we say iron, two plus, sulfur, two minus. That's just bookkeeping, right? You don't write that in there when you write the compound. You only need one of each, FES. And then you name it. So it would be iron, two plus, sulfide. Okay. Now the last group, type three. Type threes are always non-metal, non-metal. Okay. These two are ionic compounds. That is, you do have a positive charge on the cation, negative charge on the anion. But when you get two non-metals together, they compete for electrons. They don't give up their electrons. In other words, they pull in such a way that the only way that they can form an alliance is by sharing electrons. These guys transfer electrons completely from one to the other. And then you have electrostatic charge that holds them together. But for these, you have a sharing of electrons, we call it covalent bond. So in that case, there's really no charge to identify in, in either of, the, of these cases. So what we have to do is we have to, we're gonna borrow from this convention and that begs the question, which one comes first? Right? If you've got two elements, if you've got carbon and oxygen here, which one comes first? Right? Is it oxygen carbide or is it carbon oxide? Well, it's carbon oxide. And the general rule is that element that's to the left takes the cation position and the one to the right takes the anion. There are exceptions. So most of the time that's true. But sometimes it's not. And that's the best I can do. Okay. So the first element, you just name the element. And the second part, you change the ending to IDE, just like we did for type one, type two. But we also have to say how many of them there are. So we use the Greek prefixes for one through 10, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. And I think there's a slide on that, so I don't have to write it on the board. Yes, that's the next slide. Here we go. So if we have one of them, you say mono, except if there's only one in the cation position, the first one, you don't say mono. You just, it just doesn't sound right, so we don't say it. But the second one, if there's only one of the second position, you do say mono. So that's why it's carbon monoxide, not monocarbon monoxide. But if you do have more than one in the first position, you have to prefix it with the, uh, the number. So the di is two, tri, tetra is four, penta is five, hex is six, hepta, octa. They left out two of them. Nine is Nana and 10 is Deca. So here are examples. Carbon dioxide would be the correct name for that one. Sulfur hexafluoride, right? We got six. Still only got one in the first position. 
This one, you got two. So it's dinitrogen tetroxide. And we don't say tetraoxide, it just doesn't sound right. Tetroxide. Okay, what's the name of this one? Well, first of all, where does selenium come from? That's the question. Where are your elements coming from? If there are two nonmetals, then you use type three convention. Selenium is in the sulfur group, which means it's a nonmetal. So we say selenium dioxide. Come on, there we go. All right. So when you're confronted with a naming problem like this, how do you approach it? Well, you ask yourself, is it a metal, non-metal, or is it a non-metal, non-metal? If it's metal, metal, then you're either type two or type one. If it's non-metal, non-metal, then you, you just move ahead with type three. If it's one of these, then you've got to decide, is the charge on the uh, metal fixed or variable? If it's variable, you have to use this convention. If it's fixed, use that convention. All right. Now, there's another fly in the ointment here. Polyatomic ions. Polyatomic ions are groups of atoms that are covalently bound. So they're all nonmetals. No, they're not. Not always nonmetals, excuse me. But they're bound so tightly that they behave as a single unit. And they always have a charge, actually a fixed charge for each polyatomic ion. And it has a fixed name as well. So that's good. Um, all you have to do is substitute the polyatomic wherever it's supposed to be, either in the metal position or the non-metal position. And uh, if it's in the metal position, you use one of these, actually use this one because there's only one positively charged polyatomic, that's ammonium. And it would fit in this group right here. Rest of them are anions. So they could either go in this group or that group. They won't ever be in this group because they're charged ions. So they, they have to occur over here. They could combine with this one, or they could combine with some other metal. And I've given you a list of those. Uh, let's see, where did I put it? I think it's actually in the slide set. Oh, well, it's, uh, there's a copy of it in Blackboard too. I showed you that. Oh, but here we have, let's see. This says you have to memorize them, but you don't because I've given you a chart. You just have to learn how to use the chart. Now there's a logic to some of them. They form homologous series in, in family groups. Let me erase this stuff and I'll show you how it works. You'll notice that First of all, ammonium is the only positive one in there. The rest are negatives. Then of the negatives, sometimes they have oxygen in them. And sometimes they don't. There are a few that don't. Most of them do have oxygen. So of the ones that have oxygen, um, sometimes they combine in different ratios with uh, one element with oxygen. And... This group is a perfect example of a homologous series. This is chlorine. Right? So if you, if you add one oxygen, I'll come back to that in just a minute. If you take away one oxygen, then it becomes chloride. If you take away another oxygen, it becomes hypo chloride or underneath chloride. And this one, you add a prefix called per, per chloride. Right. 
So I always start here and work my way out. You can substitute any uh, two other high uh, halogens in this position. You can substitute bromine here, or you can substitute iodine. So this would be bromate or iodate, bromite or iodite, hypobromite or hypoiodite, and perbromite or perbromate, perbromate, periodate. So just learning that pattern gives you what? 12 polyatomic ions. All right. <clears throat> Examples. There are others like uh, nitrate has three oxygens and nitrite has two oxygens. Notice the charge doesn't change. That's not always the case. For instance, when you get down here, sulfate and a hydrogen, it loses a negative because the hydrogen is a positive charge. And this is hydrogen sulfate. Sometimes the uh, antiquated term is bisulfate um, or carbonate. There's carbonate, CO3 two minus, or hydrogen carbonate, which is also called bicarbonate. Like when you take sodium bicarbonate and put it in your uh, biscuits, that's what you're doing. Sodium plus this bicarbonate ion makes that compound. All right. There's your list. Notice that this list is, is duplicated. This is duplicate of this side over here. This is sorted by name. This is sorted by formula. So you got two ways to look it up. The key is recognizing when you have a polyatomic and go look for it. So you need to familiarize yourself with these and use them as much as possible. That's what that review document and the uh, extra credit name your compound is for, to give you practice using these things. Okay, so what would this one be? Here's your cation, fixed charge, anion, fixed charge. This will be a type one compound. And all you have to do is say, what are the anions? Ammonium acetate, that's it. No more needs to be said. Everybody at one time or another has heard of ammonium nitrate. It's a great nitrogen fertilizer, especially for corn. But it can also be made into a bomb. Ammonium nitrate plus 6% by weight of fuel oil. And then all you need is a blasting cap or a stick of dynamite. And you can set that off and it will make a big bang. In fact, it brought down the Alfred P. Murrah building in uh, Oklahoma City. Okay, hydroxide is a polyatomic ion. It's OH minus. So one of these combines with one of those positives and that's the name. That's all you need to say. Magnesium is a fixed charge. Nitrate is a fixed charge. Magnesium nitrate is all you need to say. And notice when you have more than one polyatomic, you don't change the subscripts of the polyatomic ion. It behaves as a unit. So what that means is this nitrate, that minus charge is not attached to the oxygen. That minus charge is for the whole ion for the whole collection. So when you need more than one of them, you have to use the parentheses. Okay. 
And that means when you start counting up uh, atoms to determine the molar mass later for these compounds, you need to know this is two times three is six oxygens are in that molecule and two nitrogens are in there along with one magnesium. All right, in this case, iron is combined with phosphate. Phosphate is a three minus ion, always and forever. So that means iron, if it's this formula, iron has to be a three plus. So that's why we use type two convention because the iron is variable charge. All right, those, there's your decision tree if you like those things. Uh, another example with a polyatomic, potassium chloride. Uh, let's see. All right, what's your name correctly? First of all, for the first one, what do we have? Non-metal, non-metal. So that means we have to say how many phosphorus and how many oxygens. Diphosphorus, pentoxide, that one's correct. ClO2. This is not the polyatomic ion. This is a neutral compound. Chlorine dioxide, because both of them are nonmetals. So that was wrong. This one should be lead four iodide. That was wrong. This one is. Sulfate is two minus, so the copper has to be two plus. So this should be copper two sulfate. So the only one correct one is the first one. The rest of them are wrong. All right. Now, <clears throat> these naming conventions we have uh, tried to make sense of them because we sort of inherited a lot of the naming conventions out of the Middle Ages. Um, the when we say uh, iron two sulfide. That's this one, like that. We used to have to say ferrous sulfide. That's, that's what I learned when I was a student. But in the intervening years, the um, controlling body for naming compounds, IUPAC, decided that we needed something that was. Uh, unambiguous. So this system was developed and it's better actually. Uh, IUPAC stands for International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists. And the subcommittee for naming compounds uh, came up with this convention and it was a good decision. But another thing we inherited out of the Middle Ages was acids. Uh, alchemists knew about mineral acids like sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, and they, they named them before we came around as modern chemists. So we sort of had to uh, mold our naming convention around that. Well, now we're gonna learn how to name the acids. Okay, first of all, recognize what an acid looks like. The formula. The formula for an acid always leads off with a hydrogen, at least one, sometimes more than one. So, for example, there's your hydrochloric, or you can have two, or you can have three. Notice that these are polyatomics. So, polyatomics play a central role in naming conventions for acids. So you identify this one. Now, what if there's uh, other hydrogens? What if there are other hydrogens? This one is the acid hydrogen for this molecule. 
And this one, these are non-acidic hydrogens. So this acetate ion holds those hydrogens so strongly that they do not dissociate in an aqueous solution. That's the key. These guys have to be in aqueous solution to be acids. At least for our naming convention. If they're not, then you would name them by the a type one, type two, type three rules, right? This would be hydrogen chloride. But if we make an acid out of it, then it would be hydrochloric acid. All right, first you have to identify the, the molecule is an acid. It leads off of the hydrogen. Then you look for oxygen. If there's oxygen in the molecule, you name it one way. If there's no oxygen, you name it another way. With no oxygen, you always start the name with hydro. Then you look at the anion part. And if it's I, it becomes ic, hydrogen chloride, I becomes chloric acid. That's for no oxygen present. Um, suppose we have polyatomic here. All right? What is CN? CN is a polyatomic cyanide. So no oxygen, we say hydro. Cyanic. Cyanide, I becomes it. Acid. Now, what do we do with oxygen? Well, when we name oxygen, those acids with oxygen in them, we drop the hydro. You never start an oxygen containing acid with hydro, just drop it. Okay, other examples. Okay, if the anion contains oxygen, then you need to look to the anion portion and look what is that called that's sulfate right hydrogen sulfate eights become x so this is sulfuric acid all right how about this one phosphate phosphoric acid And we named this one already. That's the acetate ion. Eight becomes ic. Acetic acid. Okay. Um, what about this one? We can also write H2S. That's got no oxygen in it. So we would say hydro. Sulfuric acid. Eights become X. What about the ites? Like NO2 minus would be nitrite, or SO3 would be sulfite. So if it ends in ITE, it becomes us for the acid. So let's change um, this one and this one to uh, three and three. So this is sulfite. That means it's sulfurous. And this one is phosphite, it becomes phosphorus. So eights become ics and ites become uses. <clears throat> All 
All right, there's your decision chart. Uh, oh, these are not acids. Why do we put those in here for the acids? Let's skip that one. How about bases? Bases are easier. Whether the base is solid or dissolved in water, it's still called sodium hydroxide. So how do you tell the difference? Well, sodium hydroxide, when you write the formula, of course, you put a, an S after it for the solid. But if you dissolve it in water, you put the AQ, and then you would say solid sodium hydroxide or aqueous sodium hydroxide. And usually when you say aqueous, you're going to give a concentration. Like it might be 0.1 molar. And I know we haven't defined that yet, but we will. Passing carbon. Well, dissolved potassium carbonate in water, man, that's beyond this course. You know, do you have an acidic or a basic solution? Sulfuric acid, there you go. Dinitrogen pentoxide, writing formulas from names. Okay, so we're, we're past the acids now. Just examples. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip this one too. All right, this last slide. It talks about types of compounds that are associated with water. And these waters are called waters of hydration. They're ionic compounds. And when they form, say they, they, uh, precipitate out of aqueous solution into a solid, they take some of that water with them. And the water becomes incorporated into their structure, but they're not part of the compound itself. So for instance, um, zinc sulfate, that can be just like that. You can have a solid that's just like that and nothing else. But you could also have some water associated with it. In fact, lots of water, seven water molecules combined in this crystal structure. These are called waters of hydration. And we designate them by this dot in the middle of the line. And we do that because the water is not part of that molecule. Is part of the crystal structure, but it's separate from that. Okay, so how do you name it? Well, in this case, you just say zinc sulfate. And remember, zinc is one of those elements that has a fixed charge. So you only have to say zinc sulfate because it's always two plus and that's always two minus. But then how do you get the water? You name the Greek prefix for how many waters, and you call the waters hydrates. So you say zinc sulfate. In this case, hepta hydrate. And that names the formula unambiguously. We can rewrite this formula from that. No problem. There's only one possibility. Unambiguous means there's only one possible name and one possible formula that goes with it. All right. That's just in case you ever see one of these again, that you'll, you'll know what it's talking about. All right. That's it for nomenclature. And now you just need to practice. Learn the symbols and practice writing compounds and work in those review questions. And we'll have a review Thursday, I guess. Yeah, we'll review Thursday. 
So I'll look at that review document. That doesn't give you much time. I understand that, but can't be helped. We're, we got to get so much information in this semester, so many chapters, and that's the only way to do it. So burn the midnight oil and uh, have fun.